Moin and gluten dark. The dough game is strong today. Now to get you a little bit excited, let me show you exactly what that looks like. I hope you're hungry because at the end of this video, you will know how to master a bread like this. I wish you could taste this bread. The taste is just out of this world. In fact, this bread was so good, my mom's doggos couldn't get enough of it. <laughs> this is the bread I love to bake for myself every day. Now, this is not like any other tutorial. We will deep dive and look at all the details that matter to bake amazing sourdough bread. I will not only just show you what you should do, but also why you should do it. I feel understanding the why makes it so much simpler to follow a recipe. Understanding the why is going to enable you to bake amazing sourdough bread every time. This recipe assumes that you already have a sourdough starter. If you don't have a sourdough starter, no worries, I'll be linking an easy tutorial right here. Furthermore, you also need a couple of tools which I will be showing you right now. You need a scale, a banneton, a sharp knife or a lamp, two trays, and a heat resistant bowl where you can put some water during the baking process. A tiny glass bowl like this, a freezer, a Kartoffelstampfer, a hammer, a thing to make caipirinhas. <laughs> okay, the last three things you don't need, but they're good tools anyways. There's lots and lots of other equipment, but I'm just trying to reduce everything to a minimum so that I have something that you can follow as well at home. But enough said, let's get started with the actual recipe. For this, I will first be mixing flour and water. I like to add around 20% whole wheat in the mix because I feel this just makes the taste of the bread so much better. One more side note, the water level of your dough is incredibly important. The more water you use, the more extensible your dough becomes. This means that your dough can be easier inflated. If you use less water, your dough is a little bit stiffer. It's harder to inflate your dough. Just imagine blowing up a car tire. It's very, very difficult in comparison to a balloon, which is easy to inflate. Now the amount of water that you should be using for your flour depends on your flour. I'm suggesting 65% here because that's the value that always typically works. You want to have a look at the protein content of your flour. If you have around 10% protein, I would definitely advise to not go any higher than 65%. If you have a protein content of around 14 to 15%, you could go as high as 80 or 85%. But to make things easy, I'm suggesting 65% for this recipe. That's a value that makes it easy to work with your dough and you will still get amazing results in the end. If you wanna know how much water your flour can absorb, I made a video on this, which I'm going to be linking right here. But yes, I feel 65% is a really great balance between easy technique and still amazing bread. And in fact, you might be worried, okay, how open is my crumb really if I go that low in hydration? Well, it's all about fermentation. When we master that fermentation process, you can get amazing crumb also with a relatively stiff dough. And this is where we start the oddlies. What you do is you just take your hands and you stir together the flour. You don't want to develop any strength. What you want to do is you want to make sure that all this flour here is incorporated and then you don't have any bits of flour left like here. Yes, and let me just show you. You see the, how this dough tears now, right? And I'll be back in an hour to show you how this dough transformed. Oh, and don't forget to close this with a lid. It shouldn't dry out. That's why I like to use a pot. While we are waiting, just a quick note on my sourdough starter. 
it doubled in size after my feeding and a healthy sourdough starter is really the basis for making amazing sourdough bread. You want to make sure that you have an active starter. Keep your sardo starter at room temperature for at least two days. I mixed this bread in the morning, so what I did is in the evening I fed my sardo starter using a 1 to 5 to 5 ratio. That's one part of starter, five parts of flour and five parts of water. So 10 grams of sardo starter, 50 grams of water, 50 grams of flour. That way your sourdough starter is not too acidic. The acid will over time attack the gluten structure of your bread and you need that gluten structure in order to get nice oven spring. Maintaining a healthy and active sourdough starter is a topic on its own. I don't want to dive too much into detail, but assuming that you make your sourdough bread in the morning, I would feed a 1 to 5 to 5 ratio before you go to bed in the evening. Being German, we love using rye and the sourdough starter is made with rye flour. Now, if you don't have rye flour, no worries, you can also be using whole wheat flour to feed your sourdough starter. It's just my personal preference. I just feel that the rye starter is really going to improve the taste of the bread. Now, if you don't have any rye flour, no worries. You can also just be using whole wheat flour to set up your sourdough starter. That's also okay. If you only have a whole wheat starter, you can just start feeding your whole wheat starter some rye flour from time to time. I feed my sourdough starter spilled einkorn, wheat, rye, different kinds of grains all the time. Let's have a look now after this one hour passed and our orderlies whether it did its job. I'm just wetting my hands a little bit. This makes the dough non-stick. And just look at this. Very, very, very strong. Okay, pull a little too much here. You can see this very strong gluten network. So this is exactly what we wanted. Very satisfying to play with this. Next up, we will be adding salt and our sourdough starter. Now I'm going to be using around 20% sourdough starter, which is in this case 500 grams of flour. That would be 100 grams. This is called Baker's math. The bakers like to calculate everything based on the flour they use. That way they can scale up or down the recipe. So yes, 20% sourdough starter because I will be baking everything on the same day. Based on the sourdough starter that you're using, you can control the fermentation time a little bit. So if you were to make an overnight sourdough bread, then I would probably be going for a 10% sourdough starter. Now, if it's very hot in your environment, for me, it's around 25 degrees Celsius, um, then you might also want to consider using a little bit less sourdough starter. Now to give you some guidance on the timings, I developed this small table. Well, I just simplified it a little bit. Uh, which is going to tell you based on the amount of sourdough starter that you're using and the temperature for how long you have to ferment very likely. In this case, 20%. Let me show you how to look up the corresponding value. So you go to the column which says 20% sourdough starter and then on the left hand side you look out for your temperature. And in this case the green value is going to be the overall fermentation time the bulk fermentation time and the proofing time. So at my current temperature, which is 25 degrees Celsius, so not as warm, um, uh, it's a little bit less probably. And you can see just the difference between 26 and 24 degrees. It's almost uh, two hours already. So temperature really plays a key in the fermentation process. But please take those values with a grain of salt. I'm going to show you a super good hack in a little bit that's going to make your life even easier. And lastly, just one more thing which I wanted to say, I typically always go for 5%, 10% or 20% sourdough starter. It's normally always 20%, but for an overnight bread, I might go to 5% or 10%. So this way you can really control what, uh, what timing fits your schedule best. So starter added, next up, salt. A recommendation for the salt is 2% salt. So that would be 10 grams, 500, some math, 500, 1% is going to be five, and 2% is uh, 10. So yes, Baker's math, I'm sorry for torturing you with math. So salt, sourdough starter has been added. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to incorporate this into the dough matrix. I like to just spread the starter evenly here on top of my dough. That makes it a little bit easier. I punch it down just a little bit 
and you see how much it starts to stick to my hands, that's completely normal. You might have seen that I have been using a, a, a rice dye, so that's why this is a little bit uh, darker. And now what I just do is I just go in here and I just take the dough, pull this out and flap this over. And each time I do this, I will incorporate the dough a little bit more. Now, so for how long should you do this? You should do this. Right now you can see that this does not look like the dough, the sardo stutter has been incorporated. You should do this until the moment where you feel that you no longer have spots like this. I can guess this is going to take me around a minute. There is not really a special technique that you should do. There's many techniques. I just like this pulling, tucking down. And note with my hand, I'm even pushing the dough a little forward. So again, my main purpose here is not to, to knead, but just to homogenize everything so that I have a nice a dough where my sourdough starter and the salt has been added evenly into the dough matrix. See, and it's already looking better. And note this tore here a little bit, nothing to worry about really. That's completely normal. Some people asked me before, okay, when I auto release, then this happens. This is really nothing to worry about. This is completely fine. But this is also a sign that you should incorporate everything just a little more. I'm happy with this. You can see that the sourdough starter has been incorporated evenly. Um, this dough is still relatively sticky, as you can see. <laughs> Give it a good tap. <laughs> and uh, next up, I will just let this sit another 15 minutes because that way your flour is going to absorb all that additional water added through the sourdough starter. And then we will be doing some bench kneading. Now you could be kneading this for another 15 minutes, but I suggest to just take a break and stop because all that work is going to be wasted. Just wait 15 minutes and I'll show you again how magically this dough came together. You can see right now it's also not that smooth, but it's gonna look really nice in 15, not 50, 15. <laughs> Excuse my German English, 15, 15. <laughs> See you in a bit. Time for the dough to wake up again. I hope you're as excited as I am to just see the consistency of this dough again. Let's use our hand again and just go in here and check. Oh, such a good window pane effect. That's, um, that's how your dough should be. So if your dough is not like this, if you can't stretch it like this, then at least for this recipe, you have used too much water for your dough, very likely. And you can see I didn't need that much. It was just really a little bit. So this dough is already looking very good. I will take this now and create more strength. And what we are pretty much doing is we are repeating this test more or less and then just folding the dough over like this. And this is just creating so much incredible dough strength. In fact, I have a full video on creating dough strength, but since this is going to be a simple bread, with a little bit less hydration, we don't have to develop as much dough strength as we have when we have a very wet dough. So just a little bit, a little bit of bench kneading, and uh, then this dough is pretty much ready. So I will go in here now, take this, fold this over. That way I can remove the dough easy from the container. And now I can just take the dough out with my hand place it on the surface like this. And now what I do is I pretty much use the sticky side to take another sticky side and fold this on top. So 
I go here, I pull this out. See, I'm using the tension of the surface, the dough sticks, and that way I can pull it very far and fold this over. And this way I make the dough stick here, sticky side sticks to the sticky side. And this is just creating incredible strength in this dough. And just have a look. I think this dough is almost ready already with so little work. This is where the auto lease really comes into play. The level of hydration and the rest that we did after adding our starter. You see, I can't even stretch this anymore. So this dough is looking very good. What I will do is I will take this, rotate it a little bit like this. And what I like to do is I like to just use the tension of the surface to roll up the dough. I'll show you one more time so you can also do this yourself. I'm going in here, I'm not having flat hands. My hands are a little bit like this. And now I'm taking this and I'm pulling the dough over. You see this here on top does not rotate as much. Then I can rotate the dough and do the same thing one more time. Okay, one more time. So 45 degree angle, roughly I would say, roll this over and this way we tuck the dough together. Go to the side, rotate, pull. Go to the side, rotate, pull. And this is really good technique to master. You can use this also when making buns or so. Great technique to master. And one more time. Good looking dough ball. <laughs> and I actually forgot one thing, which I'll show you right now. Mm, ah, are you scared, Mr. Dough? <laughs> I'm just extracting a tiny piece like this. I didn't measure it. Um, it's just enough so that I can cover, oh, sorry. It's just enough so that I can cover the bottom of this container. So just take your dough, make sure you place it evenly in your bowl and mark it with a rubber band. And the rubber band, always a little tricky. So I might have to just correct this a little bit, but I feel you get my point. <laughs> so how much should you use? Just as much as it's required to cover the bottom of the jar, not too much. Now in the end, I will not throw this away. I will use this for uh, my discard sourdough starter bread. So I think this is already quite accurate. I have a second bowl, which I just place on top so this does not dry out. Now we wanna fix this because we just cut something off the dough. Same technique again. Just round this up. Good looking dough ball. <laughs> now I like to use a clean container. I like to use a glass container like this. This is where I will be placing my dough and I'm going to close this down so this does not dry out. Roughly two hours have passed and now it's a good time to do a stretch and fold. So this dough has flattened out a lot. We see a large pocket of air here. I'm going to pop that because this is not coming from the fermentation. This is coming from the kneading process and it might create a very large bubble, which I don't want. Now, I have prepared some water here. It should be cold water. Wet your hands a little bit. And now just gently go around the dough and remove the dough from the sides. If uh, it starts to stick, use some more water on your hands. All right, more water on my hands. And now what I will do is I will fold this dough up and then fold it over. That way I get the dough to stick to itself. And now this side here on top is not as sticky as the side here at the bottom. That's something to keep in mind. And I'll show you why that's important in a little bit. When stretching and folding, this is the coil fold technique. Now there's different techniques, but this technique is very gentle. It's not going to damage our dough structure. We don't want to destroy those tiny pockets of air that we already created inside of the dough. So the less you touch the dough, the better. So go here. 
you see me going in here and I'm now lifting this upwards until it's removed here from the side and then I'm placing it down again. And now the side which was previously here is now at the bottom which means it's also not sticking as much. I will now rotate the dough and repeat the same process from the other side. And the trick here is really to create a big surface that you fold over. So that was the first stage of the coil fold. I just do one from each side. Now the next stage is I go in here and again, the already not so sticky side is already here at the bottom of the container and that makes it easier to remove the dough. And now I will uh, try that this here is now at the bottom and this here is rolled into the dough. Like this. And you see, I folded it over. And now I'm going to do this one more time. I'm basically creating a roll. And now I still have this side. And what I will do is I will take, lift the whole dough upwards and then roll it over. So let me show you. I have the whole dough pretty much like this. And now I will place it here and place the other side on top. And now what I like to do is I can just tuck it a little bit using the tension so that it's more located in the center of the container. Just going to lift this here and you can see the dough now looks like this from the side. This created a lot of strength while being very gentle. <clears throat> and those are the pockets of air that we don't want to destroy using the stretcher folds. <clears throat> I will keep fermenting this and the moment I see that the dough flattened out again around the same time as uh, around the same amount as last time, I'll come back and apply another stretch and fold. It's been around five hours since I added my sawdough starter and normally this already doubled in size by now. Now the reason for it not happening could be multiple, maybe the temperature changed, maybe my sourdough starter wasn't as active because I had it in the fridge the day before. Many, many reasons, but using this trick, nothing to worry, you just have to wait a little bit longer until this doubled in size. If I were to just stick to my regular fermentation schedule, well, I would have screwed up in this case. Now that the dough flattened out, I'm just going to be doing one more coil fold. And you can see it already sticks a little bit less to the container. Good signs of fermentation. much increase as I hoped for but you can see some nice pockets of air right here so it's going into the right direction I guess it's gonna be around an hour more or so but first up let's do another coil fold the dough has already here in this bowl increased in size you see it flattened out it still retained a little bit of its structure time to coil fold one more time you see, I also don't have to remove it anymore from the sides of the container. In this case, it's already good. I'll just do it once. The less I touch the dough, the better. Good looking, very jiggly dough already. Yeah, and I'm a little confused why it takes so long today, but also just looking at the temperature of this dough, uh, the last few weeks it's always been 26 and now it's just 24 degrees Celsius. So two degrees in temperature is making a major difference. So this probe is finally coming together, but much, 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 much slower than I expected. But also looking here at this bad boy, it looks nice and bubbly. So I am now going to proceed shaping it. 
First up, Benetton preparation. I like to use rice flour. I already sprinkled the Benetton a little bit. This really helps with the bread not sticking to it. Now for shaping, I like to use this container because I can just flip it over. This makes it very gentle. If you don't have a container like this, I recommend you to just go inside like this and lift your dough on the surface. Now is also the moment where we have to start using flour. Just use any flour that you have. Um, I typically use the same one I have I use for the dough. This can also be whole wheat flour. Sprinkle some flour here on your surface. Just like this. And now what we do is we just take this container, flip it over, and hopefully the bread is going to come out just fine. So um, I will place it like this alongside uh, um, like this. So let's see. <laughs> this is always the moment of truth. Does the bread come out? Yes or no? And it does. Perfect. What some bakers do is they pre-shape their bread. That would even out the crumb a little bit. But in this case, since we just bake one bread at a time, we don't have to do this. I sprinkled flour here so the bread won't stick here at the bottom. Now, unfortunately, I did not place this so well. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this side and I will fold it into the middle and I will fold the other side over. That way the bread sticks together. That's what we want. This is what shaping is about. We want to make sure that our bread holds its shape. Just already going to place the Benetton right here because that's where we will be putting the bread inside. Now I will start from the bottom. That's a little bit easier. I'm just taking this, pulling this out a little bit and placing this here. Now I'm just brushing off some of that flour here because I don't need it. I want the sticky side to stick. This side, which is very, very sticky, uh, is going to be folded over here. So I will just take it, pull it out and fold this over one more time. Now that's also the reason why we removed some of that flour. Now this is how the bread should look like and just look at those nice signs of fermentation here. Very, very jiggly dough. Now I will take this out and then I will roll it together. I'm just going in here, pushing out, rolling, pushing out, rolling. And now if it starts to stick here, you have to use a little more flour here. And just like that, I'm rolling the dough together. I'm giving it a really nice tight shaping. Now, this is pretty much our shaped dough. Uh, you can cover it already with some flour and place it inside. But what I like to do is I like to just close this here. That way it looks a little bit more beautiful during the bake. And I'm just going here and I'm pushing this together like this. Same thing from the other side. And this is pretty much our shaped dough now. Now to make sure it does not stick to the Benetton, cover it, brush it gently with some of that excess flour from the table. Now lift this over. This side now has to be at the bottom. Take it over like this. Very, very easy. One thing you can do is to get a little bit of extra oven spring if you feel your shaping didn't go so well. You can just take the sides here and put them together like this. Some kind of in Benetton shaping. Now what this will do is this will pull your dough together and give you a little more tension. And this works better the less flour you use during the shaping process. Perfect. I'm just going to be using some of my leftover flour here and sprinkle this on top. Now the proofing stage starts and the proofing stage is finished the moment this dough passes the finger poke test. In my case, that's going to be around two hours, but this really depends a lot on your environment. So take a finger and just gently poke into your dough and you can see how this dent is recovering very, very quickly. 
So after a minute, this dent is going to be done. This bread is not ready. We want to wait until this dent just barely, barely recovers. And that's the moment when we are ready to bake. This is going to take another four hours, but if you don't have those four hours, no worries. You can take your dough and you can place it in the fridge for around 24 hours at 4 degrees Celsius. That's around 40 degrees Fahrenheit. I will be proving this at room temperature now because I want to bake the bread the same day. But yes, if you don't have time, no worries, you can definitely use the fridge. Make sure to try to place the bread on the lower rack in your fridge because there it's typically a little bit cooler. I'll just be showing you one technique for proofing in this video, but there's others. And in fact, I made a video on this, which I'll be linking right here. But back to the video. And I'm gonna be using a small little hack, which I will show you later at the end of this video. But let's keep doing the finger poke test now. Probably two hours, I'll just cover this here. I like to use a small plastic bag because it makes sure the dough does not dry out. I'll leave it at room temperature and check the finger poke test every 15 minutes. It's been roughly one and a half hours. Let's have a look at how this dough looks like now. Ooh, a nice size increase, looking good and bubbly. So finger poke test one more time. Take an area where it's floured and you can see how slowly this dent is recovering. Yes, so this bread is ready. And now comes my trick. Dough temperature is around 22 degrees. I'll leave this in the freezer for 45 minutes now. Let's see what the temperature is going to be afterwards. You probably might be asking, why are we using the freezer now? And that's an excellent question. Before baking, we have to score our dough. Scoring is the act where you take a knife, a sharp knife, and cut into your dough. By doing so, you are creating a weak spot in the surface of your dough. During the baking process, the gases, which are still cold inside of your bread, are going to increase in size. This is what causes your bread to rise in the oven. Now, by scoring, you influence the area where your dough should mostly grow. If you would not score your bread, your bread would just burst at different areas. If you want that beautiful ear, then it's very important that you really master scoring. Now, if your dough is at room temperature, that becomes way harder. And that's the problem. Chances are you might be tearing your dough. And this is something we don't want. When tearing your dough, you will not get that oven spring. You will not get that nice looking ear. And this is so much simpler when your dough is a little stiff, a little colder. That's why I love using this freezer hack. You can bake your bread the same day, but still get the benefits of a cold outside on your dough. So my fridge is around minus 24 degrees Celsius. Let's see what our Mr. Dough says. Bye, Mr. Dough. I leave my dough for around 45 minutes in the freezer. 15 minutes in the process, I already start preheating my oven. For the actual baking process, it's essential to create a lot of steam and there's two methods pretty much for a home oven. Many bakers like to use a Dutch oven. A Dutch oven is pretty much just a pot with a lid that you can close. During the first half of the bake, some water evaporates from your bread. Now this water can't escape because the lid is closed. This creates a very humid, very steamy environment inside. This is excellent for your bread. The Maillard reaction is not happening that fast, so you don't have a crust. This means your dough is still relatively wet on the outside and this is where your dough can grow. Without any steam, you'll have a crust right away and then your bread cannot increase in size that much in the oven. Dutch ovens make it very simple. However, you also have to invest in expensive tooling. I'll be showing you three different Dutch ovens, but then afterwards I will show you the technique that I like to use the most, my personal preferred technique. And for this, you also don't have to buy a Dutch oven. The Dutch ovens come in different sizes. This one is excellent for baking batards, and those two are excellent for using bowls. This is my setup that has baked me the best bread so far though. I have a bowl here at the bottom, which I'm going to preheat. Then I have a stone. This could also be another tray of yours. And the really big trick or the big hack is this additional tray here on top. Now, I'm not going to be preheating this tray. I will be removing this tray. Then I will place my bread here on the stone. I will take the stone out, load my bread, <clears throat> pour in boiling water in here, which is going to evaporate. 
and this will go up here and it's going to be trapped here below. Very, very similar to a Dutch oven, pretty much. And well, you just need to have two trays and you need to have a bowl that can resist high heat. No Dutch oven required. What I will do is I will remove this tray now while I preheat my oven. The oven has been preheated for around 30 minutes. Preheating some water. And our dough is around 5 degrees, 6 degrees Celsius. Now, just take your banneton and flip it over. Hopefully this is going to come right out. If not, you should have probably used a little bit more rice flour or your dough has been over fermenting a little. Let's hope this comes right out. And Mr. Dough, ah, yes. This is always amazing. Now we have to be a little bit quick I'm doing that 45 degrees incision because I want to have a nice ear in the end. That worked very well, especially because the dough cooled down. Back to the oven. Add your steam. And so this tray I also just placed before it hasn't been in there the whole time. Make sure that you just use upper and lower heat and I'm baking at around 230 degrees Celsius. Don't use the fan, the fan is just going to blow away all your steam. The magic moment, half time. Let's see if this turned into a success or in a fail. <sighs> Lots of good steam. Removing the top tray. <laughs> what a beauty. I'm also going to remove the rest of the water here from the bottom. Et voila. Another 20 minutes fresh out of the oven. bread and I'm very happy with how it turned out. Beautiful pattern here. Maybe a little bit too much flour here on the top but this is something you could easily brush off and this nice looking ear. Good signs of fermentation. I think this bread turned out just perfect and I'm very excited to also have a look at the cramp. Oh, that crispiness. <laughs> magic moment. <laughs> nice looking crumb, beautiful. Maybe it could have been a little more open, but then again we also didn't use that much of a wet dough, it was more a stiff dough. So if you want to get a little bit more open crumb, then what you could consider is to just use a little bit more water. But in the end, it also becomes more difficult to handle. And that was the goal of this recipe, to just make something that's very easy to make and still super delicious. So this turned out exactly as I hoped. It's time to put this to the test. I just sprinkled a little bit of salt and some olive oil. Mmm. This is so good. Especially the crispy crust paired with the just so soft and fluffy inside. What a great play of different consistencies. And that's why I also love this ear. It has so much flavor. Mm. <laughs> Excellent. And even without any olive oil, this bread already tastes amazing. This unfortunately brings us to the end of this video. I hope you learned something new and that you had a lot of fun. Now to me the why is always so important, that's why I'm sorry this video has been a little bit longer, but I figured I want to show you everything very much in detail. 
If you have questions, need some help, some bread troubleshooting, feel free to drop a comment in the comment section. Happy baking and may the gluten be with you.